good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are listening to this from. It is nice to see your smiling faces. That's right. There is a video version of this podcast. If you go to patreon.com backslash the daily BA, you can access that. Some early access videos from the YouTube channel I run. So today we have Carl Binder. He was one of the last students of Skinner's at Harvard, believe it or not. So really cool to just to be around that history. Soak some of that up. He jumps into that. But we also get to tackle something I'm really excited to, to really dive into with uh, you all here. He talks about accomplishments and how accomplishments are different than behavior, and I've always struggled with this. This is one of those things where I get to ask some of the questions I've had for years, but we really got to dive into it. So I hope it's useful, hope you find it interesting. And with that said, let's just jump straight into this. Roll that intro. Uh, let them take advantage, I was wild all record, all record deals. Tell them talk your talent for the quote. All record, all record, I still want to act, not the ghost. Before we get going, Carl, would you mind just kind of going through a little bit of, of who you are? Because I don't want to speak for you. Um, okay. Like, you're Carl Binder, a OBM extraordinaire, but I mean, like, for, for, for those who don't know who you are. Yeah, so... This is probably more than you want to hear, but you can. Oh, go! We got time. You know what I think? I was thinking about this this morning because I'm about ready to do a YouTube video about this myself. About I think I'm the sum of a whole bunch of inputs, and those inputs started with Fred Skinner when I, as a philosophy student in college, uh, uh, wrote him a fan letter after reading Walden Two, and he said, you know, he was very encouraging and said, "We'll stay in touch." I was going to a PhD program in philosophy at the time. So I stayed in touch. I got a ride the next summer to see him in uh, Cambridge, knocked on his door. He had me sit down. We talked for a while. He said, have you ever thought about applying here? And I said, not really. So he recommended I apply to Harvard. I did. They let me in a whole series of events after that. But I wound up being able to study there. And he was toward the end of his career. But I spent a couple of years doing independent studies with him, like reading verbal behavior and helping him edit about behaviorism and things like that. But in a way, as important as that, he then introduced me to somebody who introduced me to B. Barrett, who was a real pioneer in applying, first of all, laboratory work. She had been a postdoc with Skinner and Og Lindsley, and so she had a lab, a real full-on operant conditioning lab in the basement of an institution for then people we clinically referred to as severely and profoundly retarded. And uh, so I did lab research there, but, in, but I, within about a year... She said, I'd like you to take our programmed instruction classroom and turn it in, which was essentially discrete trials, and apply the standard acceleration chart. So I spent about 10 years doing work, which ultimately would involve curriculum design, training teachers, doing consulting all over the country. And really, in a certain way, there's an article that I published in 1996 about behavioral fluency that sort of summarizes all that. But in the process, I got to learn and be mentored by, like I did my doctorate dissertation in Elizabeth Houghton's first grade classroom with Eric Houghton as my major advisor, Um, uh, you know, and was doing that work for about 10 years. And then in about 1978, uh, Lindsley said to me, who'd really been a mentor, he said, I want you to go into the corporate world and take what we've learned into that. And I didn't know anything about that. And that was the early days of OBM. So there were some, and it was called performance management mostly then. So we, he introduced me to some people, but it didn't really help much. I just jumped in and almost went bankrupt, but in the process, connected with the International Society for Performance Improvement, ISPI. And that was kind of the home of program instruction people, but those people had invol- evolved into performance improvement. So Tom Gilbert, Gary Rumler, Dale Brethauer, names that became very famous in the OBM and performance improvement world were the people there. And partly because I'd been Skinner's student, even though I was kind of a kid, they accepted me in at kind of almost like a peer le- young peer level. So I got to learn from and be mentored by Tom Gilbert and Joe Harless and Don Toasty and all those people. And what I tried to do from precision teaching, the first area that we discovered was, um, I mean, I was talking about fluency and writing about it and trying to promote this and figure out what marketing was and all that. And in the meantime, cleaning houses to pay the rent. And uh, uh, so then um, I had, there was a colleague uh, uh, who worked for a major company in the banking industry called Omega Performance Corporation. And um, I was talking about fluency all over the place and what it meant. It was true mastery and all this other stuff. And he said, you know, banks have been deregulated and now they can sell stuff. And we're trying to develop a sales curriculum for bankers 
does this fluency stuff, could this like work for product knowledge? So I didn't really know. So I did an analysis and we kind of turned product knowledge inside out and made it needs customer focused sales knowledge. And we did some stuff in banks that just knocked the tops off of traditional training. And we published a couple articles and they then got read by people in other industries. And I built a company called Product Knowledge Systems, which I spent about a decade um, delivering programs for like global 1000 companies that, that combined structured reference materials, fluency-based practice and coaching, and some other stuff. And again, we, not, we became known as the guy, if you want to ramp your people up really fast in product launches, do this. And in the meantime, what I had learned is, and everybody knows this, but they talk about it, but they don't have a way to deal with it necessarily. I'd been introduced to Tom Gilbert's work by, by Eric Houghton, who gave me a copy of Gilbert's book, Human Competence. And, um, and I thought it was interesting, but what happened was when we started delivering these programs to salespeople who had to practice with cards and dialogues and systems and all that, they had to do it on their own. They were outside of our classroom. So I said, wait a minute, this, this behavior engineering model thing of Tom Gilbert's can be very helpful because I'm working on knowledge, but we have this other stuff on the top row of his model that we could use to implement. So what we did is we got people to set clear expectations for you should practice on the job. We gave people tools to practice and record their performance. We arranged consequences to reward people who had aims. We built a whole performance system around implementing training, and it was very effective. And so that was my introduction to Gilbert's work and the behavior engineering model. But the language of Tom's model was kind of nerdy. So when we introduced it to clients, they didn't get it. It's like data, what does that mean, or instruments? So I tweaked the language, and I'd been highly influenced by Og Lindsley to use plain English, and he turned me on to Steve Jobs about simplicity and user experience. And so what we did was we developed this model that eventually got called the Six Boxes model by one of my clients, which was basically Tom Gilbert's concepts, except in language that's really easy for people to understand. And so they didn't make initial errors and all that. So that led me on a path that eventually, quite a few years later, we, I left that consulting business. Um, I did big projects in a bunch of companies of other kinds, not just sales, but customer service at Amazon and AT&T Wireless and manufacturing environments and so forth. And we refined this methodology that's based on two very simple pictures. We call it the, the uh, performance chain and the six boxes model. And it focuses on accomplishments, which is another thing Tom taught me. He said, behavior is costly. Accomplishments are the valuable products of behavior. That's what's important. That's your contribution. So we built our performance analysis around what we call work outputs or accomplishments. And we have these two models that finally, about almost a decade ago, we said, wait a minute, we can commercialize this. So if you ask who I am now, I'm somebody who's very interested in fluency-based instruction, who keeps my hands in working with colleagues of mine in precision teaching. I'm on the precision teaching or the standard acceleration chart or standard acceleration society's board, all of that. But my day job is uh, taking these models and doing what we call six boxes performance thinking. So we develop, we develop performance consultants inside of companies. And we also train coaches and managers and leaders to work with their teams and individuals to apply the very same models to help develop people. So that's a really long story, but that's who I am is the sum of that. <laughs> I don't think that's that long of a story. I think it's good to frame the context of who you're talking to. Okay. One of the things that I was hoping that we would just, I and mean, you already kind of jumped into it and you already kind of explained accomplishment-based learning. Mm -hmm. um, I, I found, I, I feel like, well, just from a personal point of view, I think when you and I first encountered each other, I had I I struggled personally really hard with that uh, those ideas because mm -hmm. as a behavior analyst, I'm you know we're so fixated on behavior and mm -hmm. we're we're so fixated on something occurring in time. Yeah, what is a? Uh... I still am kind of I get torn on this. This will be fun yeah. to help me out. Okay. Yeah, this is good. Let's let, this is what we want to do. Want to disambiguate these ideas. Yeah. Uh, what what is I know what you told me, but I mean, like, I, I'm just like, if, if someone's trying to figure out, okay, I read this book, The Eating Conspiracy, and I, I, I see these things called Educating for Accomplished Citizen, mm -hmm. and I see this guy named Carl Binder on the internet or whatever, and I hear about these six boxes, and I want to be an OBMer, and 
I keep hearing these phrases like accomplishments, accomplishment based outcomes or outputs. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't understand as a behaviorist though, mm -hmm. shape, I, I want to control contingencies and consequences and shape up behavior. Mm -hmm. What is, what's the, what's the road to getting people to flip to, to get okay. to understand that? What's that, really what's that roadmap question. look like? Well, the short version is, and actually this is our colleague that you probably both know, Brett DeNovi, uh, who I've been working with and collaborating with in different ways recently. Uh, Brett had the same question some months ago, and I was trying to explain to him. And I said, wait a minute, have you ever been in a meeting where it didn't produce anything? And he said, I mean, it was like the light went on. Because it's the difference between all the stuff you do, the activity, the behavior, and when you actually produce stuff, like agreed upon action steps or plans or decisions or documents. So I, I love that because it really, it really hit the bullseye with Brett. And he said, now I understand. And it's a good example that we've all probably experienced. But if you step back from that, there's a couple layers of, of this. One of them is uh, G what Gilbert said. He basically said, look, behavior itself is costly. It costs us money to support behavior. And remember, this was originally an organizational context. So he was talking about in companies and not-for-profits, but organizations. What's valuable to the organization are the things you produce through that behavior. So some of those are tangible, like, widgets and documents and reports and like that. Some of them are a little less tangible, but they're still things. We say they're countable nouns like decisions and relationships are actually accomplishments. You, you do a lot of stuff to try to establish and then maintain good relationships, depending on the context of what good means. Um, so that's one place to start. And Gilbert had this equation. He said the worth of an intervention is equal to the value of the accomplishments that it helps produce or increase divided by the cost to produce the behavior. And if you think about the world in that way, you realize, oh my gosh, there's a lot of environments where people, for example, spend a ton of money on training and they may not actually get many accomplishments out of the deal. So it helps you think about what's valuable. So that's one part of it. But there's more to it than that because um, I used to think, kind of like you were just suggesting, that... Um, that the reason that people had a hard time with this, because believe me, everybody does, is because I hung out oh, with you, you beat me up on it for like an hour on the phone. Trust me. <laughs> <Is> that, <yeah>. <laughs> well, but, <laughs> no, this is good. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 you know, the thing is, um, I used to think it was because I hung out with behaviorists or because I spent a lot of time with trainers. And as I probably told you that, that ain't it. It turns out it's we humans. And if you think about it, man, if you're in the jungle, you know, and you're trying to f get some dinner, or whatever, you're, 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 you're watching the behavior of other humans and of animals. You're watching activity, movement. And so I think, as, I think as humans, actually, as organisms even, or whatever, as mammals maybe, we spend a lot of time, maybe not precisely like we behavior scientists, but we spend a lot of time observing, talking about, recounting, remembering, etc., our behavior. Uh, what we don't spend a lot of time with, except for the really concrete stuff, like, I'm sure that that caveman I was just implying would know how many, you know, deer he brought in last week or whatever, if he had counting skills. But, um, but he might not think of his relationships or his decisions as things. But when you move into the modern world of us interacting with one another, whether it's in an or, uh, organization or not, even in your family, you realize that, you know, table set, dinner ready to go is real important. Or like with my sons years ago, when we were trying to teach them to clean up after dinner, they could do all the cleaning in the world, but they, we wanted them to produce, you know, um, dishes in the dishwasher, ready to go, cleaned up surfaces, pans in the, you know, and, and so you start thinking about that, or you get to think about all your relationships, write them down, which ones are, check off the ones that are really good. Check off the ones that maybe aren't so good. You start realizing that they are things that you can behave to produce. And the advantage to thinking in that, there's a, two or three reasons that it's good to think that way. One is because it connects you up with the value you deliver. Like I was, in fact, working with an ABA business owner recently, and um, she was talking about an initial coaching session she had with some of her employees. And as soon as she made, as soon as she first of all called accomplishments contributions, and then she talked about how they made a difference for the organization. Her employees' lies, eyes lit up. It's like, oh, this is how I help. This is what I contribute. So it helps us in the conversation. Second thing is, 
you can list behavior till you're blue in the face, and it can be really long lists. But if you cluster it by the things that it produces, if you say, I want to produce a good report or a good learning plan or a good hire or a good funding decision, then you can start listing all the behavior you have to do for it so you know what the behavior is that you should care about. And then you can apply everything we know from behavior science to make that behavior happen. But the behavior is focused on producing something of value. You can measure it more easily than you can measure behavior because it's often permanent products. Um, you can connect it up with the value that's delivered to the organization or to society. And if you come back full circle to your original thing about education, you can say, well, okay, it's really great to learn all those uh, you know, theorems in uh, geometry, but do any of them help you build a house? Or you, know, you can learn the math until you're blue in the face, but do they help you do an algorithm that will work in your software program or... Do they help you figure out how much money you need next month? So Harless spent his professional career taking Tom Gilbert's idea of accomplishments and sort of making it doable. So he had a set of programs and companies where he would focus people on start with the accomplishments and then figure out the behavior that's needed, and now we can create conditions for that behavior to happen. When he switched into the education world, when he kind of retired and said, I wanted to help change education, he said, what should an accomplished citizen be able to produce? And he came up with stuff like informed reproductive decisions, a balanced checkbook, you know, a good job, uh, you know, a clean house, whatever it is. And he started really fleshing out what it means to be successful, productive, da 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 in terms of those kinds of things. And then when he was asked by the folks in Newton, Georgia to create a program, which, that, which the book really set the frame for, it was mostly about jobs, but there was more to it than that. But a lot of it was being able to produce the accomplishments or the work outputs that are valuable to those companies. Now, one other point, and I'll stop talking, but oh, um, <laughs> I can go on for as you want. Next. That's what we're here for. <laughs> okay. Um, one other thing about that, which is that the word accomplishment itself is a challenging word. Because when I first, it's a cool word from sort of marketing and communication. It sounds like you got something done, you know, it's valuable. But what I observed, even in Gary Rumler, and even in some of the real thought leaders in our broad field of organizational performance improvement or organizational behavior management, um, a lot of times they describe accomplishments just with passive verbs, the equivalent of procedure completed. Now, from my kind of point of view, I said, I don't really care about if the procedure got completed. What I care about is what did that procedure produce? A widget without defects, a good decision, a properly adjusted uh, steam valve. What's, what does it produce? And so... Um, we And if you look up the word accomplishments in the dictionary, you see more of it has to do with behavior than, than um, things. And, and as I started looking around among my colleagues, including in the performance improvement world where people are supposed to know about this stuff, they listed accomplishments that could be everything from an organizational business result to something I produce to a change in behavior. So in our work, we talk about being accomplishment-based, but we actually coined this phrase work outputs because it sounds more like accountable thing, and it's the product of behavior. And we use synonyms like contributions, for example. But what we found is that um, not only are we not familiar with this distinction, but it's a tricky distinction to teach until you come up with a really crisp language description. And then the one thing else that we added that I don't think anybody else in this world has used in our field is the notion, as you said earlier, that it needs to be countable nouns. It's like information is not a useful accomplishment because I don't know, there's no unit of analysis. But if I can say a report or a data set, now, I got, now you're cooking because now I can say what a good one is and we can evaluate it and all the rest of it. So I don't so, know, does that help? <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. There's, this, uh, there's this small paragraph I want to read that I think pretty much summarizes questions. everything you just said. Later, there's a thing where they're talking, he's talking about his son. And Joe Harless says, and he says, later he told me, education is just learning words and messing around with numbers. I wish they had taught me how to use words and numbers for something. After securing his first position with a large company at a shocking starting salary, he remarked to me, 
I don't know how to be an engineer and I feel like a fraud. <laughs> he's a real good engineer now. I got to tell you, <laughs> Lee is his name, but he's a cool guy. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> so I've got a few thoughts, questions to kind of keep this going along. First one is I'd like that it's not focusing necessarily on the topography or the form or the shape of the behavior, right? Mm-hmm. That's crucial. So much of our response definitions, what we're taught in, in behavior analysis is like driving into an operational definition that really focuses on that. Now, I'll come back to that in a sec. But the second thing is that the outcomes focus is kind of cool to bring back into your bigger picture, your story, because that's what they talk about in Walden too, right? Mm-hmm. Like they create I've... a system in which mm-hmm. there's certain outputs that need to be produced, correct? Okay. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that way because it's been a long time since I've read Walden too, but you're probably right. Yeah, it makes <laughs> yeah, sense. Yeah, I dig how it kind of ties into your larger story of showing up and knocking on Skinner's sure. door, essentially. Yep. Um, and then for anyone wanting to understand Walden 2 a little bit more, uh, I'll link it in the show notes. Go check it out. This kind of uh, utopian view on how a society could be, could be informed by uh, behavioral science. We'll just kind of mm-hmm. keep it there. Um, but I... To get into it a little bit more, behavior, I'm taking some notes is what I'm looking at down here. Um, so my th- my point of contention with this, and it's both are useful, first of all. I've looked at behavior. I look at outcomes. You were one of the first that told me to really focus on the outcomes in a workshop five or six years ago. It's been super useful. I don't want to discredit that. My thing is behavior produces those outcomes. So where or when do we look at it? Do you have a sure. point in the process yeah, where you're like, whoa, absolutely. we do need to dive into this more? Sure we do. Of course. So a couple things. One is we don't use the word outcomes work outcomes either because it's just like accomplishments. It might be a change in behavior. It might be dollars. So that's why we have our own language for this. But that's okay. I don't want to yeah. nitpick. Correct me as you want. Because yeah. outcomes means all kinds of stuff to people too. But But first of all, the other model beside the six boxes model, which – which was built on the three-term contingency, but recognized that unlike white carno pigeons and hooded rats, individual humans are different. And so you have to take individuals' characteristics into account when you're looking at humans. The other model that we use is called the performance chain, and it's the definition of performance. And it says human performance is behavior that produces work outputs that are valuable because to the extent and because they contribute to organizational or business or societal results. So when you go backwards from that and you be sure that we've identified work outputs or accomplishments that are valuable, they really do are valuable or else let's get, let's get rid of them because they're waste, we then go to the behavior. Now, the thing about behavior is sometimes it can, we can describe it at a level of like tactics. So for example, if I'm, if I'm trying to develop a sales guy, salesperson, I, I'm, I'm probably not going to task analyze how they should dial the phone and pick up the phone and speak to their people, I will probably say, you ought to keep in touch with your customers on a regular basis. Now, that's a very high-level description of behavior that you might call a tactic, and they can execute in all kinds of ways, but it's sufficient detail for them. On the other hand, if I'm in a nuclear plant and we're adjusting some dials and knobs, I'm probably going to have two guys and one guy will read the step and the other guy will repeat it and do it in front of them to be sure it's done exactly and precisely the way it should be or you might blow up the world. So there's a whole range of, in practical terms, about how much of the topography, how specific and how concrete we want to be. And for example, when we train coaches and managers, um, if I'm coaching you about how to produce a requirements analysis, let's say, let's say that's the output. And that's part of your job. And you, you're a new guy, and we want to help you get up to speed so you're a little better at that. Uh, if you're a new guy, I'm going to probably say, well, here are the steps. Let's go through the steps to be sure you don't miss anything and you know the details. If I'm an old timer and I know how to do it, it's just that there's a whole bunch of resources I need and, you know, et cetera. I might say, you know how to do this, right? And Neil say, yeah, I do. I say, okay, well, let's just talk more about the things that support or get in the way of your doing it because that's what we want to focus on here. So my point is the level of detail where we specify behavior depends very much on context. We don't want to specify it more than we have to because, first of all, in a human interaction, that can be condescending and annoying and time-consuming. But also, we just want to have it at the level where we can then say, okay, what are the conditions needed to support it? So I bring that up because as behavior scientists, of course, you know, you start out with the 
topography defined. And although, although I love to quote Og Lindsley because he often said, you know, even in the pigeon lab or the rat lab, we're not, what's really important is the accomplishment. That is the switch closure. Because that's what he says. We're just talking about some kind of behavior in the front end yeah, of the yeah, rat. Yeah, yeah. And rats vary a lot in how they do it. So you can even at that level make the distinction and say, there's some flexibility in terms of how precise we need to be, if that For makes sure. sense. And so my thing's been behavior to most, I think, is that middle part, right? Like there's something like an ABC model, antecedent behavior consequence, it's that middle part. But for me, it's behavior has been that operant, that whole thing. So when sure. we say we don't need to focus on behavior, uh, I kind of get, or uh, we need to focus more on the outcomes and the behavior. It kind of like throws me for a loop well, and it makes me think of like, what happens if something is only outcome focused and starts to produce unethical behavior, right? But it's producing the right absolutely. outcome. So absolutely. when when do we focus on which is, I think, been my inner thing that I've struggled with figuring out. Yeah, so like let me if, if the yeah. ends not just justify, but define the means, then absolutely. is that what you're saying? What do we get? Yeah, well, so it's flexible. So one of the things to know about our approach is if you look at organizational behavior management, which I think is a terrible name only because nobody gets a job in OBM unless they work in an applied behavior analysis company. They get jobs in human resources or training or management. Yeah. So it's a bad marketing thing at least. But if you look at OBM or at the human performance technology world, there's some really complicated, detailed models and procedures out there. And one of the th reasons that we went in the direction we did of plain English and simplicity is because a lot of people we encountered, it was like too much, too complicated, too, too rigid and all that. So the reason we call our thing performance thinking is because we have these two models. One is the six boxes model, but the performance chain is the other one. And part of it is what we call performance improvement logic. And so the logic is, depending on context, you always want to start with the outputs and the organizational results you care about and be sure that you've identified the outputs or milestones or contributions and be sure they contribute to business results. Now you look at behavior and you say, okay, how much do we need to know about behavior in this context for this purpose? Then you say, we've got behavior, we've got work outputs, and we've got, we've got results, organizational results. We can measure any of those. So we look at measurement. And then we say, let's take a look at the six boxes and see what's working and what's not working, and then we arrange the conditions for that to happen, and so forth. So my point is there's a logic in this thing, and you can apply it at a very nitpicky level if we don't want to blow up the world in our nuclear plant, or if we want to be sure we teach the kid a, a math skill without you know, engendering more errors, or that kind of thing, or maybe not. But um, it, we, we make some assumption, which is that the user of this way of thinking is thoughtful, and that they're and and so of course in the ethical environment I think that's a perfect example. In fact, we've I've recently been having discussions with some of our colleagues about turning the BCBA task list into outputs or accomplishments. Excellent and then, segue. It, yeah, and then providing coaching for that. And one of the interesting things is it's not just the task list, but if you look at the ethical guidelines, we can probably specify both outputs and behavior. And we're going to define guardrails around that behavior. And it still might be flexible, but there's certain stuff you don't do for sure. And then there's certain generally recommended procedures. So, for example, in a company, for example, at Amgen, in the Amgen factories, where they're producing, where we've got like 200 certified six boxes performance uh, practitioners around the globe, and they're helping to develop and improve and sustain performance in the, in the plants that produce these a biologically based drugs, basically, which is what a what a biotech product is. Um, it's really precise. You can't make any mistakes, or you'll blow the whole batch of the drug. And so they have what they call NCs or non-conformances, and that means you didn't follow the procedure exactly as written. So in that context, just like in the ethical context, we're, we play the straight and narrow. On the other hand, if I go to the sales department at Amgen, and I say. Um, well, you need to get your doctors so they agree to your clinical statements. Now, you can't give them any gifts because that would be out of bounds from the FDA's point of view. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff you could do in developing the relationship. And so here's some strategies and tactics. So you set the guardrails, but you're not following the steps. There's a level in between. So the assumption is that people are smart enough when they're applying this in real life to adapt it 
to the requirements of the situation. And sometimes we screw up. And then we say, you know, oh my God, I should have specified that more clearly, I guess, because they did whatever they did. They had an intimate relationship with their employee or something like that, you know? So I think we talk about the task list. It seems to be a running theme with every single person we talk to somehow about, oh man, about criticizing kind of current state of the field stuff. And we always seem to have that discussion about, I don't know, poor competencies and, and just in general, poor practice and how that leads. And a redesign of the task list and with outputs would be very interesting. I'd be curious. It makes me, my, one of my favorite parts of the book actually is his critique of subject matter education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that like what you described the task list being, it is basically a subject. It's even more specialized than that though. Even it's not, it's, it's, but it's so subject matter focused and it doesn't necessarily look to produce like a functional output, right? Well, so, was, yeah. And yeah. I got, there was I, Carl. Maybe you remember this: the Drake conferences in like the seventies. Wasn't there a discussion around an alternative view that was focusing on something like this? Uh, I is that this, was is that this, was slightly before my time of getting involved in those things. So I never went to those conferences, but I think there have been those discussions. Um, but, but again, behavior scientists are behavior scientists, and so we're looking at behavior. It's just in practice, even in the lab maybe, but certainly in practice, if we want to produce behavior that's valuable, that's, that's worth it, we better know what it's supposed to produce, that's all. And kid that meets AIM in a precision teaching environment is perfectly good. Speaking, though, my pet peeve, uh, uh, one of my pet peeves in the task list, beside the fact that, frankly, you know, I've had real estate agents that could pass tests and couldn't sell a house. And I think that may well be true in the field of behavior analysis as well. But um, I love the taskless item, single item that says use precision teaching. It's one of my favorites. Like, oh, really? Okay, well, that's a whole field. There's a, there's a society devoted to that, dude. You know, like, you're gonna, how are you going to pass that? But anyway. I... <laughs> no, 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 do it. Go. This our, our, our podcast is called the Controversial Exchange. That's what we do. You should have heard no, Rick. I you should have heard Rick critical. have a total like. <laughs> yeah, I don't <laughs> want to be too critical. I mean, the thing about it is, I think when you go, you know, we, our programs are certifications too, our, our practitioner program, and our, but we need you to produce outputs. And so, for example, if you want to become a certified six boxes practitioner, you need to actually produce a thing we call a multi-table, which is a detailed analysis of the performance in a spreadsheet a plan and a couple of other things that meet certain criteria and we'll have you keep redoing it until they do. That's a valuable product that you would use on the job. I don't actually give people tests about whether they know what a work output is or not, because even if they did, I want to be sure they can produce a useful tool for, you know, thing on the job. So my big problem with most certifications, and it isn't peculiar to BCBAs or BACB stuff, is that when you have a knowledge-based certification, as I was just kind of joking, you know, you can pass that test like a son of a gun. And, and then the question is, can you do anything? And if you, if you were lucky to have a really good supervision and you had really good models, as some of our colleagues are, you're going to be brilliant. But you might not. And there's more and more programs, as you know probably better than I, that are sort of degree mills because there's a lot of money involved. And so the consequences... The consequences reward passing the test, and I don't know what else. I'm not sure what else. And and people care about helping kids, but as one of our colleagues who's the president of one of the large ABA organizations in the country recently pointed out to me, she said, you know, people used to, got into this field because they wanted to help kids, and now people are getting in because they want to make money. And I don't have anything against making money, but sometimes these things run at cross purposes. And, that's, and, and the other thing, to be fair, is that when the BACB, BA, BACB, is that it? Yeah, was formed, and I dearly love both the, you know, both the, the, the two top people in that organization, and they've been very good to me over the years and all that, but they are a, what's the word? It's not certification, it's a credentialing organization, right? And the practice in credentialing organizations is pretty much to be test-based, so they're following an industry model that exists. It just, in my view, has scary ramifications. Because when you got 80,000 BACBs and growing, I don't know how you're going to ensure uh, clinical practice unless you, turn in, unless you turn the task list into actual 
job-based outputs or accomplishments, and you teach supervisors a coaching procedure or process like we have that can actually help people produce a better whatever, a, a, a da- database decision or treatment plan or whatever it is, you know, relationship with the parents or, you know. So that's kind of what interested me with the uh, Drake conferences. Is I understand there was a discussion around should we certify people or should we certify procedures? And that oh. procedures sounded like it was more along the realms of what, what you... It's close, although procedure is still a form of behavior description. I mean, I want to produce the outputs. Yeah. I don't know. Like where that could have gone could have been totally different. And um, I'll concur with you there. Like the the folks that higher up in the BACB, like they work Mm -hmm. their ass off. They Mm -hmm. like, I love them as well. Um, And they're operating within that larger, whatever it is. The It's a hard job. Yeah. Yeah. They're operating in, like you were saying, like this, the credentialing world has, they actually have their own agency that yeah. s- specifies the rules that they have to follow. It's always just been a fun thing for me to think about, like, what would it be like if we just did something totally different um, on that procedures realm or outcomes based, you know, accomplishments to shift, based, to, sorry. To shift the topic a little bit in an interesting way, I'm kind of excited because Terry McSween, who you might know of the Quality Safety Edge, who's like a longtime thought leader, senior guy in our field in safety, uh, you know, behavioral safety work. Um, and I've known him for years, but I've never done any work with him. And he recently invited me to speak at his conferences next year. And um, one of the reasons I've never gotten involved in behavior safety is because it's one of the most pure applications of a behavior-based thing you can get. And it's hard to define the accomplishments because, for example, you can say, well, pallet of stuff on the shelf without accidents, you know, and the pallet on the shelf is the output and the without accidents is kind of like a description of the behavior for getting there. So it's a little bit awkward to be accomplishment based in that world. But one of the things that's happening is there's now people in the safety world talking about, um, human performance technology, HPT, which is what came out of the ISPI, Tom Gilbert, Joe Harless world. And as far as I can tell from Terry, their definitions of HPT are a little funky. But um, anyway, I'm I'm bringing in, uh, I think it looks like a colleague of mine who, Gina Gina Resterzadro, who is a originally instructional designer, consultant, trainer, who is now the head of this global uh, community of 200 or so Six boxes performance, uh, uh, six boxes practitioners at Amgen, and they're doing heavy duty performance improvement. And what's interesting about it is it's not about safety in the usual sense of like having accidents, but you have to, you can't, you can't make mistakes. And so there's this whole field called, um, for example, high, the high reliability organization, HRO, and there's a couple of other acronyms. But it comes out of the nuclear industry and the pharmaceuticals industry and various places where you cannot screw up. And it's at least as bad as having stuff fall on you and kill you. It could kill patients and so forth. And so, But Gina and her community practice are very, very experienced and expert performance consultants using our methodology. And they're accomplishment-based. And so what we're going to talk about is how do you be accomplishment-based in a world where how you do it makes a lot of difference because you might kill somebody if you produce that output. So I'm quite excited about the dialogue that's going to happen at this at Terry's conference because I think it's going to bring together these two things in an interesting way. And your comment about the, about the procedure certification reminds me of that in a way. Because, yeah, the procedure is important because it's how you produce this output, and so let's, let's marry them tightly yeah, together. Yeah, and you and- – what I liked about that is like you could theoretically be audited um, and you could start to build it into That's this right. larger framework of when we know something that works very well repeatedly, like it starts to turn into an evidence-based practice or Absolutely. evidence-based kernels as big one talks about them. Now we can say, okay, it's very easy to determine, like, are you following That's right. the steps that we've seen in the research do produce these sort of accomplishments or outcomes. So there's actually another thing linked to that, Ryan, which is, uh, Gilbert had this notion of exemplary performance. And, and what he said was, if you're looking at a group or an organization or a bunch of individuals or teams that are doing stuff, if you measure their performance by their accomplishments, you will often find that, like you know, Michael Jordan or whatever, some people are exceptionally high on that, on that measure. And most of the people are someplace in the middle. It's usually some kind of a normal curve or something like that. 
And what he pointed out was the bigger the difference between the average competent performers and the stars, the more what he called uh, potential for improving performance there is. So the idea is if there's a lot of space there, even if we can bring the average up this far, it's probably worth a lot of money, a lot of quality, a lot of whatever it is. So you're always look, looking for these big gaps because if you can even close them part way. And what he said is one of the ways to do that is you go to these stars, the exemplary performers, and you interview them and you observe them and you extract from their repertoires the usually small bits of behavior that they do that's different from the other folks because it's usually small bits that make that big difference. Once you extract those, you can then promulgate those. You can build them into your training and coaching and all that. And again, you might not raise everybody to be stars. You're not going to make Michael Jordans, but I'll bet you make them, even if you make them 10% better, it can be worth a lot. And so those are the things that sometimes turn into what you described, which are so-called best practices. You say, we're going to do it like this because we've learned that it helps you produce this out, output you know, at a higher level more consistently. I think producing consistent results is the challenge of anyone who's trying to manage people's performance. That's like my day-to-day, everyday struggle. I just think about that, and it's like overwhelming sometimes. Well, you know, that reminds me of Joe Harless actually coming back to his book, Eden Conspiracy. When he was in the corporate world, he had a series of programs, and one of them was the Job Aids Workshop, and one of them was Front End Analysis, and one of them was Accomplishment-Based Curriculum Development, ABCD. And his Front End Analysis program is as close to our practitioner program as any, but the difference is that Joe was a big believer in job aids, very precise, very specific, checklists, decision tables, recipes, depending on the kind of behavior, and he was really good at it. And if you go through one of his programs, it is job aided down to the last nit. I mean, he has these forms where you do analysis and your rating is this is this highly important, medium important, low important? Is this I mean really detailed stuff? And you know, I'm at the other end of the spectrum. And we used to have a lot, before he died, we used to have a lot of these conversations because he was kind of a mentor to me. And he said, I want to watch your experiment because what we're doing is we've created these simple models where there's a lot underneath them. But, and, and we don't, you know, when I train people, it's nothing like as precise as what he described. But what happened with his thing is that, like, People would just, they'd go through his programs and they say, this is cool, Joe, but I'm not going to, it's kind of like direct instruction scripts. Some teachers don't like them. Well, same deal here, man. It's like, okay, I got the idea, Joe, but I'm not going to use your forms and fill out everything. Whereas I'm a kind of, I give some tools, but they're really flexible. And so he used to say, I want to watch your experiment. He says, because the reason I kept doing that was the more precise and specific I got, the more consistent a result. So he liked the payoff, which is fair enough. He could go into Boeing and train 400 people to do his thing, and they would all do it more or less the same way. Whereas probably if I went into Boeing and trained 400 people, they'd all be using the same logic, but it would kind of come out in different creative ways. And But the thing is, what I do, a lot more people can get into because they don't say, oh, geez, this is way too detailed. So there's this interesting trade-off. Yeah, it's the balance between like a fluid approach versus a very specific descriptive yeah. approach. I yeah. always like I always struggle with that because I want to it's like you have you want to give people opportunity to be creative in their job, you know, and you want to give them the opportunity mm-hmm. to express themselves and as long as they're producing what they need to be producing, how they really get there really should be irrelevant as long as it's consistent with values and all that other stuff. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's like if people are unmotivated or just, you know, if it's just a job and they're clocking in and clocking out and it's not their passion, uh, it's, I, I find it, if you don't dummy proof what you're doing, you get such a poor result on the back end. It requires so much continuous oversight that the payoff is you have to, to get any payoff, even not, not even yeah. a great one. Well, and it depends on the context. I mean, you're working in educational environments where precision is pretty important. Um, one of the things one of the things about that, for example, in our, in our programs, we have this one-page job aid, which describes, for, which describes each of the elements of the performance chain and the, and the six boxes and so forth. And what is a good description, for example, of a work output? It has to be a thing, not the behavior that produces a thing or the measure of the thing. It has to be um, a valuable product of behavior. It has to be countable. You have to be able to count the good ones and bad ones. 
And then it has to ideally be valuable or it's not worth paying attention to. Now, we try to teach people those criteria so that as they work, they will self-evaluate. And that, to some extent, uh, at least ensures a certain amount of precision if we coach that and reinforce it and all that. Um, and that can get that can get you a, a certain a certain distance along the way, but it it also depends. It really does depend on the on the context. Do we need people or want people to be that precise, or actually would we like some variability? Like for instance, I'm working with a right now that and and I'm working with their sales force and they hire really experienced salespeople and it's a really cool company. And um, part of what's cool about it is that unlike most medical devices, salespeople, they are not commission based. And so what that means is that they can afford to say to the doctor, you know what, this actually isn't the best product for this particular case, doctor. And of course, this just blows the doctor's minds because they say, wait a minute, this guy isn't just trying to push product. He's actually trying to help me do the right thing. And so these guys develop these long-term relationships with the doctors where they're trusted, absolutely trusted, and they're given access to the operating room and all this other stuff. And what's fascinating about it is that as a company, beside just paying people a salary rather than a heavy-duty commission thing that makes them turns them into sharks, um, is that it's also a collective thing. They're all helping each other. And there's huge variability. The company does not impose any particular tools. They have them available, but you don't have to use them. And so at one level, for me as somebody who's trying to do performance analysis and identify best practices, one angle on it is it's a nightmare because I can't figure out what the one thing is. And beside, even if I could, nobody would do it because they all have their own thing from their previous jobs. But the other thing that's beautiful about it is there's a lot of really successful practices that people have discovered so we can say, you know what, we're not going to tell you which one, but all four of these things work really well, and some of your successful guys do them, so try this. And so, you know, when you let it be flexible, it's like variability, in, you know, selection and variation in the principles of behavior. If you allow more variation, then you got more stuff to select from, and you might get some really cool stuff out of that, you know? Man, selling stuff not on commission sounds horrible. Well, what's funny is what's funny about that is that I mean I've worked with a lot of medical devices companies. I don't want to go too far about or about the, about or but oh no, I'm, it, no, I'm just I was just thinking from my own personal experience. I, I understand. I was slinging whips and appliances, and man, it was just like it really for me. I guess the way I operated at the time was like man, getting that commission was just like and competing for well, of it. Of course, There's, oh that oh, but, that just like alpha A type personality absolutely. thing that comes out. And so you get these guys, and it's very interesting because most of the people stay for a really long time. They love the culture. But most of the experienced ones will tell you, it took me a year, year and a half to kind of get so I didn't feel like I had to go for it. Like I could actually turn down a thing or I could say this was not the best thing or I could you know, share stuff with my colleagues because they weren't trying to beat me. Now, that's not to say that these guys still don't really like being at the top of the of the leaderboard. It's just that paying the rent doesn't depend on that completely. It's they're competing in that realm, but they're free to look at their patients and their doctor's well-being for the long term, and they don't have to close the deal. And like some of these other sales it's guys, a lot who's... more like prestige than livelihood. Well, yeah, and and it's also long term because when the doctors trust you, believe me, you get this a competitive advantage. And the doc, the doctors know these guys are just trying to sell product from these other companies. So it's a fascinating thing though, because it allows all this really smart stuff to float to the surface, all this variability, you know, anyway. Yeah. Well, no, cause you were talking about the reason I, I the other reason why I think that's important is cause just to, get, to go back a little bit from what you were just saying, uh, before you were talking about how we were talking about money a little bit and how that influences things and we're talking mm -hmm. then values and that stuff. And just, just out of curiosity, what is your opinion on the idea of, money coming into the field and kind of flowing in across the board in, in educational practice or even clinical practice and well money's money's good you know uh or private but, equity even uh i the challenge that i see there and it's pretty obvious i mean one of the things again i admire about our colleague brett denovi is his pitch is uh let's uh let's figure out how to scale the size of our business and protect it basically from the big fish who are going to come and eat it because we want to maintain clinical quality and that doesn't always work if it's an investment banker looking at her or his spreadsheet. And then I know the other end of it, which is I know a few 
a few ABA business owners who had successful businesses, and but they maybe weren't quite big enough to have the economies of scale they like, or they maybe would like to have had some investment. And so they got acquired by these conglomerates that are growing by acquisition. And what the business owners tell, and they maybe are staying in the company, maybe they're the some they take a senior role in the company now, but they don't own the company anymore. And what they're saying is, man, this sounded pretty good. To, but you know, these guys are really focused on just headcount and the spreadsheet and clinicals quality is kind of drifting. So I don't think there's any necessary incompatibility, but it's just like in politics. We get we get politicians who uh you know, refuse to bring the thing to the floor because uh, the oil companies would quit paying the money or whatever it is, you know. And so I think it distorts stuff. And we have to be, I mean, I'm glad I'm not, I'm kind of an outsider looking into that world. I'm not a BCBA. I think it's a tough world in so many ways. I think it's great when we have BCBAs who are entrepreneurs, who maintain clinical quality, and who make a good living. And I, and we probably all know a bunch of people like that. And I have nothing, I really, I think it's fantastic, but I think the, con, the contingencies that are available and particularly when the big money's available and you say, Oh man, I can cash out now, or I can have more resources to do stuff. I think sometimes it turns out it doesn't work that way because the people who control the strings then drag it in some other direction. Comes across the bargain, you think? It can. I mean, the thing is, I like people like Elon Musk, who's a maniac and a genius and who certainly has done very well for himself financially, but who's trying to save the world. You know, and to me, those two things ought to go together. If we, you know, in our field, it was that. Is that <laughs> yeah, there you go. Exactly. Yeah, cool. That's one of the great ones. So my, my point being that um, the, one of the things I love about our behavior science community, and this is what happened to me when I got it with Skinner was that we're all a bunch of people who want to change the world in a good way. Most of us are. We're highly motivated. So I've known some behavior scientists who really didn't care too much about the outside world, and they just want to do their experiments. But most of the people I know, certainly in the applied parts of the field that the, each of us is involved in, really care, want to make a big difference. And so I think it's fantastic if people who want to make a big difference can also be financially successful and can even use that as a measure of their success because it kind of measures how many bo- how many lives they've influenced. But I guess we have to have counter control. And I don't know how you do that when you have a community of people that's growing at however many thousand a year that we are in the you know applied behavior analysis world. I don't know how you manage that. Um, I don't think anybody can, you know. You got to slow down first. I think it'd be the first step. That ain't going to happen. I mean, as, they, as people often say, you know, we, we, hope, we hope they don't cure autism, you know, because then we'll all be out of a job. You know, I mean, that's a stupid thing to say. But, if, yeah, there's a lot more need than there is capacity at this point still, you know. Do you think, how do you think values play into that, though? Like, how do we get – so isn't that about outlining our values? I mean, that, that goes along with what Harless talks about. That goes along, I think, with – when you're talking about organizational results, I think results are basically the things that you produce to get to achieve your values, right? Well, is that kind of well, we is? see. I I have a, a kind of a slightly nerdy article that I published a few years ago about in, in JOBM integrating organizational values with performance. And the way I see values is they are typically initially expressed. They're often expressed in some kind of value statement, like focus on the customer, or quality, or innovation, or we care about the yeah and and it's hard to make those alive unless you look at the specific job and the outputs of that job or the process or the department or the function. Now, if you look at someone's job role and their accomplishments or outputs, you can usually take that value and say, how would this adjust what we think of as a good output or what we think of as the behavior that's needed to do it? And so you can do that. Um, I also, though, think that the one of the things I really appreciate about, about Steve Hayes and about uh, acceptance and commitment training is the focus on value-driven uh, behavior. And, and I've certainly seen, and I'm sure you guys have seen more of it, you know, among our colleagues, our applied behavior analysis colleagues, there's a lot of conversation about values. And, um, and a lot of business owners, I just spent a weekend with about a dozen ABA business owners a few weeks ago uh, 
with our coaching program and with Josh Pritchard and a bunch of our other colleagues. And it was really fun after hours, kind of after the workshoppy stuff, to just hear, hear people because these are really values-driven people. And I think if you're always checking your values and you're, and you're really following kind of what comes out of ACT, which is, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on here, man, but let's use that as our navigational framework, I think it's huge. The question is, you know, do, how do you maintain, you know, it's the old uh, temptation thing. You know, you say, well, this isn't quite in line with what we ought to do, but man, you know, we could do this if we did that. So part of it is, how do you arrange contingencies for yourself and for your team and for your whole organization that keep people focused on that? And I think a lot of it is building it into the individual coaching and expectation setting of managers and supervisors and people at each point in the organization to make it real. Like, how did we live that value today? What did we do here? How did we make that decision, you know, based on this or based on that? I think you can do it. And I think it's what matters, really. But man, <laughs> it takes work. It's, it doesn't just fall into place. We know that. You know. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess. I think that, I mean, obviously, you know, ethics in general have a tendency. I mean, they're they're fairly relative, at least from my point of view, at least they are. I don't know how, but I'm not an objectivist in that way. But um, is it possible or you think that partially what's missing is a shared value or, or explanatory framework that we come from like that? Like, is it possible in a field for us to develop that? Cause I, I, again, not to keep going back to the book, but like, it's just the discussion about building community partnerships and, mm -hmm. and getting people on the same page and, mm -hmm. and making sure everybody buys in and, and almost sure. like a Democrat a de democratizing ethics and like, and, you know, and almost a, a smaller social contract outside of like what would be occurring, you know, in the context of like a, a nation or a country. Um, well, yes. Yeah. I, I mean, my answer would be yes. And there's ways to, it's the question is how do you execute on that? So there's a, there's a word that everybody uses in business and such alignment, right? And you can have alignment in relationship to lots of things like our business goals, our annual revenues, whatever it is. But to me, the word alignment in this context means much like what you're saying, everybody working from the same set of values in practice, in really doing it, not just it's on the wall in a poster or something. And, and with the exception of like of the the social significance, you know, like we we operate towards socially significant change. I can't think of like what or I guess maybe the dimensions, seven dimensions, or I guess Bear Wolf and Risley are like our values. I, I don't know. I guess I'm trying to think like they're very vague, you know, and they're nondescript and they don't really drive moral or ethical behavior towards a particular end. Right. Or like, or like where, where you, where your, I don't know where your character is embedded inside of you. you know? Yeah. I mean, I, that's a very interesting question. I mean, well, I had a real interesting experience a few weeks ago. I was in Florida um, at the great, great leaps Academy conference. It was kind of a combination of applied behavior analysis and precision teaching folks. And our old friend and colleague, Jose uh, uh, gave a talk. And his talk was on ethics. And I kind of, I just made an assumption, partly because I don't know Jose that well, and I didn't know what he was going to talk about, that it would be kind of on the, you know, sort of don't give gifts to people thing or whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. And, um, but what was really cool in his talk is what the ethics that he was talking about was clinical effectiveness. And he referred back to this uh, implicitly. And I asked him afterwards and he said, yep, that's what I was thinking about. Back in the 1990s, I was actually part of this. There was an article in 1991 with the lead author was B. Barrett, my mentor, and I was on the committee with Zig Engelman and Kathy Watkins and Don Cook, and I, I forget who else was on it. And we talked about what are the elements of, from what we know from behavior science, what is effective education? And it's a really wonderful article. You can download it. It's Barrett 1991 from fluency.org if you want to look at it. But what was so cool is that what Jose was talking about was, from our point of view, given what we know about behavior science, these, you know, including things like there needs to be an opportunity for people to become fluent. If, I mean, from his point of view, the way he was talking, if an instructional procedure and program doesn't allow people to become fluent, it ain't ethical because it's not bringing forth the best of what we know. And that's just one of my favorites, of course, but... Um, I think that's a whole, you know, I think that's a whole really cool thing, which you say, 
from our world, from our perspective, given what we know, it's a lot like climate change. To my, from my point of view, it's immoral to be uh, giving breaks to coal companies. I'm sorry, it's not ethical. And the same deal is here. I think it's unethical if you don't build in everything we know from behavior science into your effective. Now that's independent of having intimate relationships with the wrong people or giving gifts to people or bribing them or some of these other traditional moral or ethical things. But um, yeah, we what have I, a very descriptive ethics it's not really more i don't know it's not virtue based i don't feel like it doesn't it doesn't ask what 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 the what is the nature of good it's a lot more behavior specifying well, and it's when, professional it's professional ethics based on largely topography it was yeah. not a functional approach to ethics yeah the funny thing is our, our field wrote there's a book by what is it uh vargas and i don't know how to say his name crapful or something like that it's, it's uh literally behavioral analysis of ethics but it was just lost 1977 wrote talked about but whoop, gone well that can be know. resurrected there's a lot of old stuff that needs to be resurrected yeah man i just think about that a lot because uh, you know one of the things that i think that i i feel very a kindred with you is the, my, the philosophy background and you know i think about studying meta ethics and ethics and, and all the different types of thinkers on that and asking what is the good and you know how i want how ought one to live and those types of big questions and all those different frameworks that are out out there and just ways of approaching that problem. And then th seeing just the list of behaviors that you need to engage in order to meet whatever that, uh, that thing is. It's yeah, it's objective in terms of counts, I guess, like you either take the water or you don't, but I mean, it doesn't really speak to the nature of goodness, you know, or the nature well, of the good. Well, that's yeah. it. You're getting it. It's topography driven, man. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, I you know, I mean, to 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 give people a little bit of a break. Clearly, if you're working in a diverse culture, you know, if we were all Catholics or you know Hindus or whatever, we'd probably have a set of things that were like our philosophical beliefs, and those would drive some of our behavior, maybe in good ways, not so much good ways. One of the questions is finding the least common denominator, so to speak, of everybody that we can all agree is okay, you know, and. Um, that's part of it, I think, that it's hard to do that. But And, of course, other fields, counseling and psychology, all have their rules, and we wouldn't expect ours to be that much different from them. Um, to me, they're just the guardrails of what you can't go outside of. That's one way to think of it, you know. But your point is well taken. I, uh, <laughs> I'm, like, trying to get you. you know, Come on, Carl. What's your opinion? <laughs> Well, no, I mean, I don't really know. I don't, I, I, what I think is it does boil down to supervision because that's the other thing going back to the, going back to the Jose talk. Um, yeah. I know you're trying to be controversial, but I'm not uh, trying to necessarily <laughs> poke the barrier. I mean, I sincerely feel these things like for yeah, real, like I do too. these Me are too. just general frustrations. And, and I think about, I mean, I've read so much, I mean, meta ethics was my favorite discipline in, in, in uh -huh. philosophy. That was, the, that was the stuff I loved reading. I yeah. loved reading about the nature of goodness and how does one define yeah. that and, then and, and you if you arrive to an amoral or moral relativistic framework then what does that really mean for us as a society yeah. that technically we all get to dictate then but then it goes back then you read something like joe harless and it's like well i you if you just take that from a pure philosophical notion and then you look at it you democratize what good is then right and then you can have a conversation about outlining what those what those things can be and agreeing on them and achieving things as a society that's substantive and not necessarily unrealistically utopian right it, and that, that's that's where i think the the where my thing is that like when i read something like walden too and i know that you said yeah you but you read you wrote the letter to skinner because oh, of it changed II. my life oh yeah, yeah. that book changed i just don't remember the whole fine details yeah right. and i and for me i i i had when you when you described like when you read it the first time and you were like the first time you hated it and then you went back a second time like i i guess i'm still on the first time i still hate it <laughs> But I, well, mean, like, I, I just thought it was totalitarian because I didn't get it that the organism is always right. I hadn't learned that lesson yet. But anyway. <laughs> OK, fine, Carl, whatever. But anyway, um, you're so good at the little jabs at the finish line. You're like, but um... <laughs> no, but I'm not kidding about that. I, I didn't. I was coming from a, like a 60s ego based. We're all separate entities thing. And I, oh, my God, this is mind control. And I didn't realize yet. That no, we're just points of light in the system that everything's coming together to produce, and we think we're separate entities, but guess what? We're not. And then if you have that view, then it changes everything. Yeah, you know? the society becomes an organism in and of itself, and then you Absolutely. look at the consequences that shape and, it from there, yeah. 
you know, one of the things, this is a way big leap, but we're talking about ethics and, yeah, sure. and you talk about different religious or philosophical backgrounds. And so I was raised as a Roman Catholic and I went all through schools and I quit being a Roman Catholic or Christian technically when I realized there were other enlightened beings too. And that's a whole conversation we could have. But, um, but, um, but those Jesuits taught me cr critical thinking and they taught me to care about the whole and they taught me to commit my life to service to others and all that. And I don't think you have to grow up as a Catholic for that. You can grow up as a humanist. You could grow up as a hippie. There's a variety of ways you might learn that. But one of the things, I read something recently on Facebook that was about Buddhism. And uh, it made the point that some people have the misunderstanding that Buddhism is a religion. And it is not. You're not worshiping anybody here. Buddhism is a long tradition of quite a long number of centuries of practices that first of all are based on kind of mindfulness and clarity and all that, but they're also based on compassion. And so the recognition is when you move into this position of, wait a minute, we're actually are, are all connected in this network and however you want to talk about it, you know, they, the Buddhists talk about interdependent causality or Dharma Dhatu or a co, co, you know, in co, de, co origination of everything. Well, if you think about it that way, then you really are uh, kind of an extension of me and vice versa. And so the Christian ethic of, you know, treat other people as you would like to be treated or the Dalai Lama, you know, he says, I'm just a simple man. And I think that ha we all want ha peace and happiness. And so from a certain point of view, ethics to me is just this fundamental thing of being human and recognizing the impact you have on others sentient beings, to use that term, and uh, and going from there. And so you don't have to have a religious perspective, but I think you have to have some sort of a view which is empathetic toward others as though uh, you might be in their shoes too, you know? And that covers an awful lot of ethical ground, let's put it that way. Do you way. think that we have an obligation to build those types of values and principles into organizational structures? As far as like, like disseminating them, and beaver analysis. Uh, yeah, as far as disseminating them, like so, I'm. I guess I'm thinking in the context of like, you know, you you get the millennial question or the millennial that 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 stereotypical like, oh, they're just unmotivated, lazy, whatever, which is hilarious because it's not true. But anyway, well, it's, yeah. no, it's not true. But <laughs> it's hilarious because like, it, you know, every generation says these kids. And then, like, even in here, even Joe Harless has a thing where it's like he he prefaces it like a page and a half where he's like, I know that everybody says these kids. No, but seriously, these kids, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah. talking about kids from the 90s. And then today it's like these kids and he, he, he gives a bunch of stats or whatever. And I mean, to me, that just describes how the chat, the, so, the societal challenges and external influences are occasioning different behavioral patterns because that's sure. what happens right the consequences are different therefore the behavior selected differently and it produces maybe less optimal outcomes because maybe we need to talk about what those consequences are not that people are intrinsically horrible yeah. but i mean uh when i think about that like and i think about the most success i've had in, in building up new people or new practitioners or just building professionals mm -hmm. is that not just looking at teaching them how to be competent producers in their work but teaching them how to be better people you yeah. know and I building that right. kind of ethos into what you're trying to accomplish. Well, I couldn't agree more with that's a really important part of human life. Why bother all otherwise? But, you know, it's interesting because you think about, we know about culture earlier values and, and you think about Enron, which, you know, I don't know if you remember the details about Enron, oh, yeah. but this is a company where everybody was very clearly trying to just make a ton of money and they didn't hear how they did it and all that. Their value was very clear. And we've even had some movies about that stuff in the stock market and Leo DiCaprio had a movie about that and all that stuff. And you think about, okay, the values here are completely selfish. They're completely, this is for me, you know, or my family or you, the Trump family or whatever it is. And then, and then, uh, and then you go in the other direction and you say, first of all, I find that creepy. I, I don't, I, I wouldn't want that life. I wouldn't want to be surrounded by people like that, frankly, but some people do, they get jazzed by it. And there's a lot of reinforcement available of certain kinds. But I think you're right, and I don't know if we have an obligation. I think that's a very personal matter. I feel like I have an obligation. I feel like when, once I met Skinner and I realized that all he was saying is if we uh, approached our own behavior like we approach other areas of natural science, 
we could improve education, management, psychotherapy, social work, government, you name it, anything that involves human behavior, we could continuously improve that. I was hooked. And I and part of it is because I was a Jesuit trained kid who thought, you know, you're trying to help the world and and I grew up, you know, Jack Kennedy, you know, ask not what you can do for you know, et cetera. And but um I think it's a very personal decision, but I don't think the cool thing about behavior science, one of the cool things, is that, so, is that just intellectually it is really cool stuff. There's no, I, I don't think you can deny that. And it's, it's like being an engineer, except it's with people kind of thing. And it's, but the other thing about it is most people who get attracted, I think, I think there is that double piece, which is, yeah, and look what we could do with it to help or do better education or whatever. So I don't know if it's an obligation in some generic sense, but I think most of the people that come into this field, unless they really did say, oh, man, I'm going to go off to that autism market because there's a lot of money there, I think most of us do care. And um, it kind of comes down to that at a human level. My, this is way off topic, but my son, I have my son is 21, and he is a musician, and he went, he's just finishing up a college degree in sound engineering, and he's a really excellent sound engineer. And I spent a lot of money on this. And, and last summer, just before his last year, he comes to me one night and he says, Dad, he says, we got to talk. He says, you know what? He says, I like music and I love music, but it's kind of selfish. And he said, you know, I've always been kind of a depressed, cynical character. And he says, I realize this because I spent all my life thinking about myself. And he said, you know, the world is really messed up. There's all these problems and it can make you really depressed. And he said, but I realize that if I'm going to be around, I ought to do something to help. So what I want to do is artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now, since last August, when he or July, when he told me that, this kid has been on fire. He's been learning programming and, and, and Python. He's been getting straight A's in schools. He's been planning his next degree. He's been figuring out how. He's like full on. And it's the same experience I had after I met Skinner. I already had wanted to be a philosophy professor to help young minds. But when I saw this thing and it, it made me see something bigger than myself, that's way better than just wanting to have a nice life with plenty of vacations and a nice house and three boats and all the rest of it. You know, it's like, no, oh, man, that's boring. Let's do something cool for the whole, whole deal, you know? Anyway. Yeah, it's nothing, well, it's nothing like finding that thing that gets your engine revving, you know? Yeah. yeah that's, that's what true. is, uh, and we actually, we have a, the last episode that Ryan and I recorded basically was us kind of romanticizing about you know how our narratives feed how we want to do and perform in our lives but also uh kind of how behavior science kind of feeds that how behavior analysis is the thing that does that and how it's just like it, it becomes obsession and i don't know if it's unhealthy obsession or healthy obsession uh, it's <laughs> the time will tell i guess but i think that uh when you when you get obsessed with something and you find that you know that's passion you know that's 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 self-perpetuating. It's self-motivating. It's self-actualizing. It's self-everything. And then it, it, as long as it, it, it also puts you in a, in a framework to share it with the world and want to just like bring it out to everyone. Yeah, so I, know, I love that idea. You're right. You know, and I, this made me reflect on something that's kind of related. We were talking about the state of the field. And um, one of the things about ABAI now to me, to go into the conference, it's like a small city. And I'm, and I'm lucky if I find old friends and it feels like a trade show a lot of the times. And it's fine. There's some good stuff and all that. But I really love Nevada ABBA or I really love the Precision Teaching Conference or I really love some of these other ones that are more like, uh, you know, a few hundred people. And you can talk to everybody or like our Summer Institute, which has 50 people. And you get in this group of people and they're all committed to this thing. And there's a vibe that's way different than going to a, quote, professional conference. And so people come to like our Standard Celebration Society conference and they said, this is the best conference I've ever been to because it was so welcoming and people are so into it. And, and I think, you know, Bill Gates used to cite these data that said that when you get more than 200 people together, it's very hard to move them forward together. And so at one point, I don't know if this continued, but at one point at Microsoft, they wanted to be sure that every part of the organization was in units of around 200 people. And when I think about that, 300 people is not bad. Maybe 500 people is pretty cool. I went to the uh, Association for Contextual Behavior Science thing in Montreal last summer, and there were about 1,500 people. That was pretty cool. I still could probably find friends pretty easily. But I think the thing you were talking about, that spark 
and that thing that we care about happens when you're with at least a definable tribe or whatever, whatever you want to call it, where like we're in this together, man, and we're going forward. And I think there's opportunity to make that happen a lot in our field because of the state associations, because of things like the Precision Teaching Conference or the or, or some of these other things, or even like your your um, your conference that you do, or several of them actually that you help make happen, Ryan. I think you know the the Convergence Conference in Seattle yesterday last year was just a gas because it was what two hundred people maybe something like yeah, that. Yeah, two hundred people, hundred in line, and uh, it had all those components you're talking about. Really, and you're and in the room and you feel yeah. it, and there's a lot of people really into this thing. It's I literally think, yeah, it was literally theater sitting, like you're elbow to elbow, like you're at a movie theater yeah. hanging out with people. Yeah. I, agree. I think that's important. The tribal thing, kind of. It's almost... Yeah, and I think there's uh, talking about opportunity. The opportunity is putting in the work to be able to foster that community. That's, and I think when you get into larger numbers, it's hard to do that. But um, I don't necessarily think that's impossible. But I think that's part of the reason that we see the differences in how people feel, like you're describing, when you come out of these different organizations, right? Part of its values, but part of it is the amount of time and care and attention you can put into that experience. And I've never thought about it until this moment, but it strikes me that as something like ABAI gets to be thousands of people gathered, there might be ways to do like they used to do in some of these mega high schools that would have 3,000 students and they'd break them into so-called villages of a few hundred each. I mean, I don't know if that worked or not, but the concept is how do you... How do you create a bunch of mini tribes then, people who really do f- come together? And I don't I know if you can, you might be well, able to do it. The thought of special interest groups, SIGs, and mm-hmm. um, the different tracks that you have, I think that's the goal there. But um, it's hard. There's, there's a difference in that kind of creating that, but then fostering that. And I, yeah, think, I, that's, I think that's the missing piece, if I were to. It's hard. It's hard. If I'm, I'm critiquing, but I'm saying it's also hard there. Like that is, I think, where the the rubber meets the road on getting that feeling that you're talking about when you go to those events. Well, that's what you mentioned, special interest groups. That's what we're trying to do at the Standard Acceleration Society. We're still struggling to be a real organization because, you know, we went from a few maniacs trying to put on a conference every year to uh, Carrie Milico sort of saying, wait a minute, we ought to structure as a real organization. And so now we've got all these VPs and a board and all that. And in some ways, it's harder to make that work than it is just a few maniacs trying to make something happen. But one of the next levels is we, once the website gets really in place, we want to have special interest groups. And what we think is that people who use this tool who are actually interested in fine and most gross motor skills or management applications or whatever can come together in ways that will have some of that vibe. And we want to really create that. And we'll see if we can do it. But you know, there's a... Accelerator program in Boulder that I visited earlier this year, and she said, or I guess it was last year now, but she said it was there was differences between having six people, thirteen people, and twenty people involved or groups. She said that there was really clear lines there, and she was pulling from some industrial organizational psychology research that I don't yeah. remember right now. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, but I've I've found like you're talking about like there's certain breaking points in which certain group dynamics seem to work or not work. And for me right now, it's just the create, I don't remember how you described it, but the, the crazy couple folks trying to put an event on, that's how we run right now. And it works, but it doesn't work when you get into large organizations. It's always fascinated me. And, uh, and have you got either of you guys familiar with sapiens? Uh, Why? There's a, Why do know homo about sapiens? That? No, like there's the book sapiens that came out. It's kind of like an evolutionary explanation of human history. Yeah. Um, I've never read it, but yeah, I'm fake. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, there's it, when he talks about the early, when he talks about kind of society, he actually gives some of the history and he, and uh, he gives kind of an evolutionary reason why people have a tendency to operate fairly reasonably in less than 150 people, as far as like the way hierarchies are get structured and just in general, how social relationships occur, because typically in the way that we came about, those were kind of the maximal amount of of people that you could inter- interact with and encounter where you had a personal relationship with them. And once you expand beyond that, it kind of becomes less and less personal. And because of that, it becomes easier and easier, and easier to fragment and create these kind of sub tribes that become warring, so to speak. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, there's. I mean, yeah, they talk a good they point. talk about that in cultural anthropology. That's a, there's a, there's an anthropological reason for that. Well, and it's funny that reminds me. Of, yeah, the, you know the the so called spiritual traditions like Buddhism and Hinduism talk about you know it's like Ramana Maharshi used to say as soon as there's a perception of another fear arises as soon as we have separation. So those smaller groups like a tribe or a family you identify with them so you're not going to treat them badly. But like you said, as soon as it gets to a certain side, then those guys are the other guys. That's what we get things like nationalism and such. And that's a really interesting point. I think it's true. I think it's really true. Yeah, it's super fat. That if if you if you're looking for an interesting read, that's very, very cool. Kind of like anthropological, evolutionary science type of almost like science human behavior thing where it takes every single topic under the sun and kind of boils it, distills it through that lens. It's very fascinating. I highly, highly recommend it. I'll put it I'm on my. Check it I'll out. put it on my t- table of a whole lot of books I got to read. I know, right? I've had to start listening on double time on Audible to get through books. <laughs> Times two. So listen yeah. to the Chipmunks read you books. I don't know that, dude. <laughs> it's taken me a long time to be able to get up to Times two, but I think of uh, not all, not on all content, but I think I've crossed yeah, it. I did like one point two five for like five hours of a book one time. And at, well, by the time I was done with it, I was literally dizzy, like nauseous, almost <laughs> like I was riding a roller coaster. That so was like timing. the information was not working right. Yeah, I've been I've been trying to train the ear. Um, so I don't know where else we wanted to go, but there was a couple questions that folks submitted go online. Go for it. Yeah, yeah go I'll for it. it. Um, okay, so it looks like we have a couple from an account on Instagram called Grandmaster Performance. Definitely seems like a behavior analyst. Um <laughs> So <laughs> the first question is, what are the most common objections you hear regarding fluency when working with big companies? Well, that's a good question. Um, first of all, I've not been doing much in that regard for a while in the sense that um, now building uh, behavioral fluency is a subset, usually in box four of the six boxes model. And I remind people that um, if you're going to really have, if you're going to spend the money and the effort to enable people to learn something, uh, you better figure out a way, and I don't lay a whole trip on them about how to do it, but you all better figure out a way that they will continue to practice over time because otherwise it will go away and it won't be useful and it will be difficult. And so I tell people, you know, you should have job aids. That's why you have coaching on the job, blah, blah, blah. So that's how we deal with it now. But when I you know, when we when I was introducing that and aggressively going after it, first for about ten years with sales organizations, and then for almost that long doing uh, doing consulting work and and instructional development and coaching work in customer service organizations, um, the, the the same reason that Eric Houghton and I decided to kind of use the word fluency to lead with instead of leading with our groovy blue chart was because we realized that the chart was like, well, who cares? But people understand what it means to be fluent, and so they're drawn into that. They get it. It means speaking Japanese quickly and easily. They get it. It means, you know, they can expand that. They, they get what it means. And so what we did, like, for example, at AT&T Wireless, where we worked with the customer service uh, uh, organization, the good news was the business manager there was a former basketball coach, so he got it immediately. But the word fluency and the idea makes perfect sense to everybody. They all say, oh, of course, you know, there's no question. And they get all excited about it and they have big insights. And then if we're there to help them develop, I mean, I had a whole training program thing called the Fluency Building Workshop where we took what we know from uh, from precision teaching and, and help people do analysis and then design a whole range of different kinds of activities. It wasn't just SAF meds, believe me, um, to build fluent performance. And it would just blow things away. Like at AT&T Wireless, you know, we took them from taking two months to bring people up to benchmark performance to two weeks. And then the people surpassed the benchmark performance by six, by 60%. And it was great, and they loved it, and it looked different. It looked completely different because it looked like a gym, and it was noisy and all that stuff. The problem was when we went away, it would dissolve, and it would it would go back to sort of being like, you know, PowerPoints and a few timed exercises, which didn't have that much impact. And so it wasn't so much that there was objections. People usually got the idea right away. Now, if we, if we implemented it in 
sort of simplistic and idiotic ways, like giving everybody flashcards for everything, that wasn't going to help. Because, But if we did things like timed exercises, looking up stuff in your system, um, having responding to objections where it wasn't like we were timing them, we were saying fluency means to be able to respond to this thing covering the key points in the same pace as you talk about your sister's uh, boyfriend or whatever, in other words, conversational pace. When we made it practical for people and gave them exercises that had face value, they went for it. But when we went away, much like in the educational world, it was so countercultural. It was so different from how people do stuff that it would just drift back because most of the people do it the other way, right? So I don't think we encountered objections. I think we just had implementation support issues. And if I were going to, you know, for example, we worked with Amazon years ago, and Amazon's a very secretive company, so they wouldn't tell me exactly. But I, I worked with their customer service people. And afterwards, I asked my client, I said, well, can you, can you share the results with me? And she said, well, not really. But I promised, when I brought you in, I promised my manager we'd increase productivity by at least 25%. And believe me, we've made way better than that. Now, I think if there's an internal, state, uh, an internal champion, I think you can maintain it for some period of time if you build it into how people do stuff. But because, again, it's so countercultural, it drifts away. So the reason I quit doing that is because I thought, well, I could make a big impact. And I had some great demonstration projects. And we published some things that were pretty cool, but I, and I could make money doing it, but it's like, if it's not going to really have a long-term impact, why bother? So that's an awful long answer, but. No, it's good. You actually wrapped up another one, which was talking about some of the common hurdles faced in the corporate world. So you nailed it, man. You didn't even know you were. The, uh, the next one is, is there a demand for fluency building in other skill areas, maybe soft skills, acting, driving, Etc. Well, I don't know if there's a demand. You know, I had to create a demand for it in sales development. Nobody had ever heard of this before. And so I published stuff and I spoke all over the place. And I finally had a guy say, hmm, that sounds kind of interesting. Can well, can, you do we, that? can we break it down into this like demand is there versus um, it's like I see what you're saying, but those folks, those folks still want to be efficient, right? They just might not know what it is that they're looking for. So need versus how about need versus demand? For sure, there's a need in all those areas. No question about it. Whether they know that or whether, they, whether they're demanding anything like that, probably not. Uh, but part of it is, you know, my favorite data set, as you maybe know, when I, when I talk about the fluency thing, is those data we collected back in B. Barrett's lab, where we showed that if you, that if you did time samples of performance, the differences between people that had graduate degrees, regular little kids, and our institutionalized students, the frequency ranges were obvious. And they correspond to exactly what you would say if you watch these three populations. And then you realize that the measurement system we use every place is percent correct. And percent correct will not distinguish between a person with a PhD and a person who's institutionalized because they're severely cognitively disabled on some skills. And so I think I, the reason I bring that up is because I think we live in a world where our entire educational system, almost all of our training uh, experiences in corporations and every place else, at best, is measured with an accuracy measure, with no time dimension. So I don't think people even know to ask for it. And it's frightening to think about our educational system from beginning to end is built on a measurement system that cannot distinguish between those two levels of performance. So I think it has as much to do with awareness as anything else, but there's for sure a need. So if you want to be an entrepreneur in it, you got to go out and sell the need. You got to have examples from that world. Well, look at that and look at that. You got to be able to demonstrate it. You got to be able to do things like say, okay, I'm going to give you a minute. Uh, count, by, count by fives to 100. And when you get to 100, keep going as fast as you can. Okay, now, how about counting by backwards by sevens from 100? And you say, hey, guess what? I know a kid that can do both of those equally fast. And people say, oh, it's a practice thing. So there's these things you introduce to people where they start to understand that difference. And that can help, that can help sell it. But people don't know what it is. So, you know, you have to show them. It's been my experience, man. And it's, uh, it resonates with everything. I, I consume a ton of YouTube culture right now. And everyone talks about a ton in there because they're, they're entrepreneurs trying to show that they have a skill set to develop certain types of videos or whatnot. And they they talk about that. Like people, people have this need to be able to communicate in their business visually, 
and through stories, like what it is it they're trying to accomplish? But until you put that out there in a similar format for them to see, there's because there's two things like they need to be able to bet on you, but they also need to be able to see something that's very similar to what they're trying to do out there. And then it's just kind of connecting the dots. Um, it's not easy. It's a simple for me. It's like very simple when you narrow it down to that. But execution takes a long time um, if you want to. Well, and the big advantage we do have with the word fluency, and the reason we put picked it, because there is implicitly a time dimension, and so. So it, that word and examples of it from sports and music and things outside of whatever the domain is that people are in do a lot to help people see the point. And then they might still say, yeah, well, how do we do that in you know, customer service or making YouTube videos? But, um, but then if you can show them, then you, know, you can blow them away. <laughs> anyway, any other questions? No other questions, but Dimitri just grabbed the mic. Oh no, I was just moving. I was shifting closer. I thought you had something to say. No, I, I, I really, I'm having a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Uh, is this uh, pretty uh, painless for you, Carl? Yeah, it is. I'm having. I gotta go to the doctor in a while, but I'm not in a big rush. So I'm, okay, this is yeah, because we can, uh, we can go a little bit longer if you yeah, want, or we can wrap it up whenever minutes. you're ready. If you got more I've stuff, got a, you know. I've got 20 minutes left on yeah. my clock. Um, well, let's just. Uh, well, why don't we just start wrapping up then? How's that? Since we've, we've, I feel like we've gone through the gamut. Um, let me ask you one final question. You kind of touched on this, but I mean, I, I, I'm really looking for a little bit more of a personal answer to this. Is that what is uh, what is the advice that you would give somebody who's looking to start an entrepreneurial journey in this thing? Not necessarily mm -hmm. an OBM, but just like mm -hmm. trying to take their behavior skills and monetize them or make them into something you can use outside of just autism. Well, there's something that. Uh that makes us as behavior scientists very much like a lot of the people in technical organizations that I've served. I mean, I worked when, when I had my company product knowledge systems, we worked in mostly big companies across probably a dozen industries, you know, high tech, hardware, software, medical devices, pharmaceuticals, telecommunications, trucking, uh, insurance, banking, blah, 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 a lot of different industries. And, um, one of the things I noticed, is that people in particularly technical industries, like you know, software, hardware, that kind of stuff, they really wanted to tell you how cool their stuff was. They want to say, this is really cool, and this is why you should want it. It's a little bit like us chart people, standard acceleration chart people, saying, this blue chart is so cool. See, it's like multiply, divide, and it's like you can, you know, it's real time, and all this other cool stuff. You should be excited about that. And most people aren't. And one of the so the first thing so the first thing you need to do is you need to do what the design people do as the first step. They call it empathy, or you need to you need to take the customer's chair. You need to say, okay, what are their real needs? What are their real pains? What are the issues that would be worth solving? And I always recommend that if people haven't read it, they read a book by Neil Rackham, who is called Spin Selling. And SPIN is an acronym, Situation, Problem, Implication, Need, Payoff. And Neil was actually a behavior scientist in England who wound up being asked to do research and then developed a whole program in sales development. And he observed thousands of successful sales calls, sales interactions. And it was all about, first of all, understanding your customer situation, then helping the customer to say, well, what are the problems that you have that I might be able to help? And then helping them talk about the implications, like what's the pain it's causing me? What's, you know, and then talking need payoff. That is, well, well, how could I help you and what would that be worth? Now, you don't have to go through exactly that sequence, but the point is the starting place is you, the customer. It's not me with my cool product. So the first thing I believe an entrepreneur absolutely has to do, and I was actually speaking with Elizabeth Houghton the other day because she's got a whole new level of stuff that she wants to do. And it's hard for those of us like Elizabeth and others who have a lot of expertise to get out of our own heads and look at the marketplace. And what she was challenged with is, are you going to work with regular kids of regular parents or parents of regular kids or kids that need special needs or better? What, who's, who's your market? So the first thing is find a need that you can help address and that ideally you can deliver a unique product with. Like if you say like Fit Learning does, you know what? In 40 hours of instruction, which will cost you whatever it costs, we can kick your kid up one grade level in, in, his, in an academic subject. That gets people interested because they've probably never heard about anybody who could do that. 
and they recognize their kids having a hard time. And so maybe, maybe that's worth it. Or for example, in sports medicine or something, if you, um, you know, if, if there's, uh, can I, you know, like you, you look at, for example, Jonathan Amy, who is, um, is really brilliant in his bringing together what we know about physical and occupational therapy and precision teaching and other stuff. This guy's got a, a niche and he can go now to teachers and other people and say, you know what? We can probably help this kid who you might have thought was handicapped beyond belief move forward. And, and we can demonstrate that. So I think part of it is this doesn't solve the problem because it's not just like show them the data. But for starters, find a place where people have a problem or a need that they'd be willing to pay for to solve, because that's the second part. As, as Lindsay used to say, you know, we need, we need to do it like the medical profession where they started out with the rich people and then they develop the thing and then they go to the masses. Well, that's kind of what Fit Learning is doing in New York. You know, they're going to the, some of their students, uh, you know, are parents who want their kids to go to prep schools and Harvard and stuff. So they have the money and they also have the need to accelerate their kids. I believe, you know, being a precision teaching guy, I still believe the biggest opportunity, and I think FIT is addressing it and some of our other colleagues are, is the average population in this country, and I know Dimitri's going to smile at this one too, who elected Trump. That is, that is we, we currently have a level of education in our, in our country which is really bad. And it's worse than a lot of other countries in the world. And, and we can, in our sleep as precision teachers, crank that up dramatically. So we need to market it better. We need to demonstrate. We need to do stuff like um, Danielle Costa, for example, who was formerly president and VP of marketing and standard acceleration society. She has a little learning center in a small town in Oregon. She knows everybody. They know if your kid, if you want your kid to do better, go talk to her. So that's the next level. You figure out who your target audience is. You figure out a message that is really about how you can help them. You actually do create solutions for them, not just your cool stuff and how cool it is. And then you figure out a way to reach out to it. So I guess that's a long way of saying, because I learned this the hard way myself, that technical competence is not sufficient. You have to have a view of the marketplace and of your customers and of their needs. And then you have to have a compelling way to talk about it so that they will recognize you have a solution. And, you know, when, when Og Lindsley and Hank Pennypacker told us at the end of the 80s to go private, because we'd been banging our, as precision teachers especially, we'd been banging our head against the wall for a long time, and we'd had huge impacts in public schools, and then, oops, the superintendent left, so sorry, you guys can go away now. Um, when, we, when we realized that we weren't going to survive and thrive in the public system, the way they framed it for the, some of us is expose yourself to the contingencies of the marketplace. They will shape what you offer they will shape how you talk about it and package it. They will direct you to the people and help you engage the people who are willing to pay for it. And that's been my experience. I didn't know what the hell I was going to do, but I mean, and I almost started. Natural environment. Uh, you let consequences select your behavior. Which the is marketplace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now you better have some money in the bank, or be single, or have some support, or be a second income for the family because it's never certain. You know, it's like the lab. You don't know what you're going to discover. But it's an inductive process where you do your best to understand the potential markets. I believe, like you do, Ryan, in your um, efforts to draw people together in your, I forget, what's the name of your thing, your conference thing you did in Miami and you've done it. Oh, Next Gen. Yeah. I believe that at least the messages I've heard you delivering and some of our colleagues is that there's a lot more solutions we could offer if we could just break out of the box. And I think the way to break out of the box is instead of looking at how cool our stuff is, looking around the world and seeing where there's some problems that, you know, we could help, it turns yeah. out. Now, we might have That's to go the, to Africa or something. Yeah. You know, but uh, probably not. There's probably things right downtown you could help with. The question is whether there's people who pay money for it. That's a whole other yeah, thing. Yeah, and that's why uh, that design thinking, as you talked about, was so interesting for us because it's got more traction. It's in plain language usually, yeah. and um, it's easy to kind of convince folks to start looking at the customer first. And sure. I like your point on the market. That's been one thing I've continually learned. And uh, no matter what your idea is, and I try to champion this too, like until you put it out there, you don't know what's going to happen. Like that is a whole different realm of data and feedback that you'll get. Yeah. 
And there's, that's what's going to determine your future in some of the in some ways of you pursuing that. Well, and there will be failures. Or how to or how to grow it, right? Like, yeah. I guess that is. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be failures. That's the other thing, of course, and that's where I my work in around organizations come in, comes in, or at least our affiliates, because I see the ABA world, the applied behavior analysis world in autism and so forth, as a very interesting world in that. We had a lot of clinicians who came together who wanted to help, who built organizations. And all of a sudden, their organizations have 100 or 200 people in them, and they don't have processes or policies or anything else in place, and they don't know how to manage people. They think because they know about behavior, they know how to manage people, but it turns out that's not quite true. And so um, what we're finding, and some of our affiliates are going there, is that there's a lot of these growing organizations that actually need some what I would call performance infrastructure in place. So when you talk about how to grow it and how to have not have it implode, that's part of the solution. There's another book I want to recommend to people, though, just as a marketing book, because um, I think spin selling lays out the underlying process of selling things to people that can be expanded on in lots of ways. But there's a book that came out a few years ago called The Blue Ocean Strategy, and what's very interesting about that book, and there's been a follow-up book to it too, but it's a couple guys, a Harvard person and a person, I think, from Korea who, what they said is, they said, look, um, from a marketing point of view, you can go into a red ocean, by which we mean all the sharks are biting each other and it's bloody, where you have a product or service and you're competing on price or small differences in features or whatever. And that's a really hard thing to do. But, you, but if you can create a solution set like, for example, Southwest Airlines did in the beginning. We're an, air, an airline that caught for short hops that costs you about the, senses, about the same cost as renting a car, except you'll get there quicker. Or, or curves, which I don't know if it even exists anymore, but that was for women who don't want to look at themselves in the mirror and don't want to be around a bunch of guys and want to get exercise. Or there's a bunch of other examples they have, but the idea is coming up with a solution and a market where you offer something that is distinctly different from other people and is priced such that you really don't have any competition. You're really kind of unique. And they take you through a think thought process, which helps. I think, I think our colleagues who are trying to be entrepreneurs could benefit from some of that thinking too, because it's not like, okay, let's start another autism business. Okay, well, maybe we, there's something else we could do that's like wildly different that nobody else knows how to do yet. Yeah, know? I read uh, The Blue Ocean Strategy a few years ago. It's really good. I agree with that. The other book I really dug on that area since we're offering some things to people is the E-Myth Revisited, where they talk about really diving into uh, what are you wanting to build here? Are you, are you making sure that it's in the interest of your values and your skill sets? Yeah, that's um, Michael Gerber. I used to meditate with his wife and stuff in Santa Rosa. He's, he's uh, yeah, that's a good one. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was actually going to mention that one too. The idea that knowing how to knowing how to bake cakes has almost nothing to do with whether you can be successful at a cake baking business. Which is exactly what you're talking about with the management <laughs> skill set, right? Yeah. And accounting and marketing and all these other things that it takes to build a business. Yeah. All right, please, wherever you found this, make sure that you go in, comment, tell us how you liked it. Make sure you answer the questions that we left there and tell a friend, please tag, share. It is the way that we can start to break through the barriers and share what behavior analysis has to offer and have these more meaningful conversations in a public sphere. Remember also you can go to anchor.fm backslash the controversial exchange and call in and leave your thoughts there as well. Again, privately where we will be choosing some of our favorites to air on the anchor app. Our next episode is on self management and narrative, finding your story, communicating your story, what role it has in behavior analysis, dissemination. I think you're going to like it. It's just Demetri and I riffing. Now, I have a quick fun fact for you. That is, did you know that 1 in 1,300 people, that's right, in 2018, 1 in 1,300 people that actually tune into the content chose to support or help out? So I mentioned Patreon before this. Patreon.com backslash the Daily VA is a values-based system that I set up to where if you're enjoying this, you can go in, you can support for as little as dollar a month, and you get some sort of exchange as well. So some people receive this in a video series where you could watch online, see us talking back and forth. Other cool things include tiers like the Daily BA, the closed like Facebook group where I share other ideas, resources, things like that. Occasionally I get courses, giveaways, and I hand out to people. 
We get discount codes that I share with you. I make that super easy to where you can snag some cheaper rates to big events and behavior analysis. And I've paired up with an amazing artist named Lester who makes these um, just great, phenomenal, really dope posters of legends in our field that we put out there as well. And you can snag some of those depending on your tier. And occasionally I bring on sponsors through this. I make sure that I communicate that with you and note sponsors. It's only if we truly, truly align on our value system. So that's our show. There are currently over 94 people in the Daily BA Patreon like closed group that's accessing these sort of things. I'd love for you to join. So really consider going and checking it out. As a gift for signing up, you get access to all the streams from last year of what we actually produce behind the scenes. You can catch Dimitri and I on Twitter at the Controversial X, that's Controversial EX, or on Instagram at the Controversial Exchange. We will be manning these. We will be answering questions and replying and sharing. So that's how you can reach us in between episodes in addition to Anchor. And to thank you so much to our listeners, you are the reason that we get to do this. The people on Patreon help us support and make it financially possible but everybody following, liking, and sharing, you all are helping in this grand vision. So thank you. And I have uh, one last thing that I need to read to you just so that we're all kosher and we're on the same page. And that is the views expressed during the Controversial Exchange podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and do not reflect the official policy or position of any other agency, organization, employer, or company. Assumptions made in the analysis are not reflective of the position of any other entity other than the authors. And since we are critically thinking human beings, these views are always subject to change, revision, and rethinking at any time. Please do not hold us to them in perpetuity. This podcast series is to educate and inform, provide discussion, and does not constitute professional advice. That's your controversial exchange. <laughs>